Hello, welcome to Boncast, our podcast series where we discuss the latest themes and events shaping weights markets. I'm Joanne Spadigan, European weight strategist, and I'm joined by our global market specialists, Jan Nabuzi and Ross Walker today. All right. Hi, Ross. Let's start with the UK budget. Obviously, very exciting. Um, there is a pre-election budget and tax cuts are widely expected here. So how much scope do you think there is to reduce taxes this time around? There's some scope, not a not a huge amount. Um, we had media reports in, in recent days suggesting that on the OBR's uh, latest forecast submission, uh, they thought there was about £12 billion of headroom. In other words, the amount of leeway that the government would have consistent with meeting its, its main fiscal rule of reducing debt as a share of GDP five years down the line. That's pretty much in line with what the estimate was back in November at the time of the autumn statement. Now, alongside that, we've had some other estimates from think tanks and others suggesting that, that the headroom might have gone up a little bit, principally on the back of... Um, lower interest rates and lower inflation. Um, obviously, there are some offsets. You know, you would expect weaker tax revenues on the basis of sort of lower nominal GDP, et cetera. So some big moving parts here. Um, the headroom might be a little bit more than 12 billion, but probably not a lot. So we're talking about, in, in terms of those headline tax cuts, one or two pence off either the basic rate of income tax or, or the main rate of employee national insurance, something like that. So maybe amounting to, you know, up to half a percent of GDP of, of overall fiscal loosening. And um, with tax kits cuts on that scale, do you expect it to do very much to reverse the long established uptrend in the UK tax burden? Well, sadly not. Um, in fact, it barely puts a, a dent into it. If you if you look at the UK tax burden, um, prior to the pandemic, it had been steadily rising essentially since the you know the early 1990s lows but obviously during that pandemic period it surged uh, to essentially sort of post world war ii highs and although its rate of increase projected rate of increase has begun to moderate it's still projected to ratchet higher um, now there are some underlying demographic uh, forces driving that um, uk growth has been you know relatively weak but um, nevertheless, you know, you, you've seen this significant ratcheting higher in the tax burden and the tax cuts, the ones that we saw for national insurance in, in the autumn and what is expected in the spring budget uh, next week, really won't change that profile very much. It will slightly lessen the rate of, of increase because although we get these headline grabbing tax rate cuts at the moment, one of the things we've also had, which have dwarfed the effects of that, is that a lot of personal tax allowances, income tax allowances were frozen. And so you've had this huge fiscal drag in the context of elevated nominal wage inflation and higher inflation. So a, a significantly higher tax burden, multi-decade highs, um, you know, really quite a, in some ways, you know, quite a, uh, a, 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 a difficult fiscal position, both for any government and certainly an incoming government after the, the next election, um, but also from a sort of a household sector consumer demand perspective. This is one of the reasons why we are, you know, relatively cautious about the idea of a, a sort of near term or at least a consumer led economic recovery in the near term. The, the tax and benefit system interaction is still going to be a drag for UK households this year. And taking that all that in, like, how does that impact what the Bank of England would do? So does the extra stimulus here uh, lessen the BOE scope for cuts this year? Probably not much this year in the sense that, you know, if we're talking about an additional quarter to half a percentage point of fiscal stimulus, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that will materially delay the BOE's rate cutting cycle. So we continue to... Uh, expect the first cut to come in August. What it might do um, is, is lessen the overall scale in that, you know, if you take the combined fiscal stimulus from the autumn statement and, and what we expect in the spring budget, you know, maybe, uh, you know, other things being equal, that might be consistent with bank rate being scaled back by, say, 25 or 50 basis points in terms of the, the, the total amount of cuts. So it probably doesn't really affect the timing. Um, but 
it, 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 you know, to the extent that that fiscal stimulus is effective in spurring consumer demand, um, it, it, it might lessen the degree of overall policy easing. But I think that's probably more a story, you know, for, for how far they can lower rates during 2025. So we've also talked quite a lot about supply on this podcast, many times, in fact. Um, so what about post-election? What do you think the UK's medium-term fiscal outlook is? And what does that mean for gilt yields as well moving forward? Well, it's a challenging one. Um, it, you know, the existing fiscal projections, in order to meet this public sector debt rule, which, incidentally, the opposition Labour Party says that it will, it will maintain that, that fiscal rule, um, we, we need to see public expenditure as a percentage of GDP coming down by about two percentage points in total over a five year period, um, which might not sound like a lot. But I think in practical terms, that will be quite difficult to deliver, particularly given that, that you know, that there will be, you know, the generalized public spending pressures um, and certainly for an incoming center left Labour government, which you know naturally would be inclined to spend more on public services and have higher financial transfers, um, you know, it will be a very difficult parliament. Um, now, it might be that over time, the growth outlook improves, you know, revenues improve. You know, we know with these public finance projections, you know, small changes to revenue or spending assumptions can have a big impact three, four, five years down the line. Um, but for now, those early years, I think, are going to be very difficult. That public spending restraint, you know, against a backdrop where, you know, significant pressures on, on health care, you know, the defence budget probably has to rise, um, you know, there will be some protected departments that will mean an even bigger squeeze in, in other areas. So politically, this is um, something of a sort of, I think, a, a financial minefield for the, the next sort of, the next four or five years. Lots to look forward to in next week's spring budget then. Um, so I guess in the US and the euro, the other focus has really been on inflation for this week. Uh, so, John, let's go to you and talk a little bit about the PCE inflation data that came in today. Um, so how does that change your views or does it change anything really for your Fed call? Uh, it doesn't really change our view for the Fed call yet. The PCE uh, number today was at 0.4 for the month. The core PCE the, is what I'm referring to. Once we have the inflation that the CPI data, and the PPI data, the, the variability around PC is really not that large because for the most part, it's a transformation. Of course, there is some, you know, I'm not going to get into the, the specifics of the calculation, but there are some uh, residuals that can cause like a like a shift in either direction. But it's not like CPI where you can have, you know, tens of base points of a miss. Uh, PC tends to be pretty close. So it was 0.4 as we expected, although there was uh, kind of this kind of whisper number, if you will, that it was going to lean towards a stronger 0.4 or even round up to 0.5. That didn't happen. Uh, it was a pretty firm 0.4. If anything, we don't think the strength's going to continue into next month as well because uh, PCs did get a decent amount of boost from the medical care side, which doesn't tend to uh, persist uh you know, the, the momentum there doesn't tend to carry over into the next month as much. So uh, we think, you know, still the picture for the Fed is is pretty good. Uh, services can remain firm for next month, but, you know, we, we expect the pullback and, and do see January as more of an outlier rather than not. Uh, and and what, what does that mean for the March meeting? Well, uh, but we, we didn't really expect it a change in March by any means. Our first cut still remains for June, uh, 25 base point increment. But what matters is we're going to get a new set of forecasts from the Fed at, uh, at the March meeting. Uh, as a reminder, last time around when we had those forecasts in December, they, for, they projected about, not about exact 75 base points of rate cuts for 2024. The data hasn't been strong to the point that it justifies a material reassessment of that. Uh, near Feds Williams yesterday kind of commented that uh, he still sees three cuts as appropriate for this year. We imagine Chair Powell will say the same thing. We're still looking for an unchanged dot plot. Let's see what uh, next week's payrolls bring. Rates have also pulled back quite a lot. So what is your view then going forward at these levels? I think uh, earlier in January, we were talking about how you know, markets did go a little 
too far too soon as in we we rallied significantly even compared to our relatively lofty expectations i mean heading into this year uh just kind of seeing from online distributors and such uh we were definitely on the more kind of bullish side of rates and even for us we, we hit some year-end targets in january right so that was uh really fast and you know we scaled back in some of our suggestions for for, for like longs and uh thought we would see a tactical pullback i think we've we've done that now and a framework that i use uh relatively rudimentary but it's a good kind of like a rule of thumb that's worked through the cycle is apply the fed's forecast and pretend like that can be a soft lid on where rates are going to go well they're pricing in uh the, their forecasts are telling us we're going to cut 75. Market is very, very close to that right now. Uh, we're only like five or six basis points off uh, as uh, as we're recording. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, I think there, there's going to be a lot more resistance to price and substantial more tightening of policy. In fact, uh, I think, you know, if you just take the balance of risks, that certainly leans into we could rally big, but can we sell off to the same extent that we did over the last month and a half, probably no, is my guess. So I think the you know the outlook for rates has become a lot more uh, positive. The carry is a lot less worse compared to what it was about a month ago. So uh, you know it, it, I think it's it's time to get constructive about front end yields again. Not so much for the long end that I still don't have too much uh, you know desire to be long the like the bond or something at these yields. We do see that the, you can actually see a path to bear steepening and bull steepening as we discussed in the previous episodes too so it should be an interesting couple of weeks as we kind of go into the fed and certainly next week with the with the payroll number but otherwise a relatively uneventful range bound week in the u.s but shifting uh last but not least to europe where we had some inflation uh numbers thing was germany and france that reported what are the main takeaways from there I mean, it's, it's fairly interesting. We obviously had a uh, for some higher than expected numbers come in in France in the month of month print in Spain. That headline was a bit higher than expected, fairly in line in Germany. Uh, but I think overall, the narrative we have for tomorrow's print is that it should be fairly close to consensus, which is at 2.5% for the headline print. Um, I think overall, the narrative for European inflation normalizing continues to be one that we think holds, even with the data we've had today. Um, and I, I do think that 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 path for inflation does look like it should get to 2%, as we've said before, by, uh, the, by the June meeting day. So I think in terms of inflation and what we've learned from today, uh, I don't think it's shifted too much in terms of our views here. But of course, I think the key focus for now will really be on the ECB meeting next week. And what we get in terms of revisions to the forecast that, as well as the kind of path for rates moving forward. Awesome. So next week, we also have the ECB meeting. What are your expectations uh, from Madame Lagarde? So the ECB next, we see next week, I, we're not expecting a rate cut next week. Of course, our more dovish expectations at the end of last year suggested that we did think a first rate cut could come as early as March. And that's clearly not the case. I mean, I think whilst we think that the conditions are there in place at the moment with inflation falling down quite drastically and falling 2% to 2% by the middle of the year um, as well, I think the messaging we're getting from the ECB is fairly clear in the sense that they are taking a risk management approach at this point where there's there's two sides of the story. There's you either wait for a while and have to cut, uh, uh, and have to cut too late or you... Um, perhaps leave rates um, uh, or perhaps you cut earlier than expected and then have to reverse course later on. And it seems very clear both from the ECB minutes as well as from what we're hearing from uh, various ECB speakers that actually they are in the camp of perhaps leaving rates a bit higher for longer. So I do think that the June cut very much remains our central scenario. But I think what we should get next week is a more of a dovish tilt uh, in terms of the forecasts We've been saying for a while that we think the ECB's forecasts at this point are a bit too high, both versus our own estimates, as well as based on where the market expectations for inflation are. So we do think a revision downwards in next week's inflation prints is very likely, although perhaps not marking to market based on where uh, inflation projections are at this point, given that they are being cautious. But I think the inflation forecast will really be the key thing to watch out for at next week's meeting. Um, 
The other side that people are considering is also the operational framework. We briefly touched upon this last week. Uh, but I think what's been clear as well is that ECB sources have come out uh, to uh, uh, give that say on where they think the discussion is heading. And it does seem quite likely that what we will have is this demand-driven uh, Bank of England-style method of reserve management, um, and that could be announced in uh, the springtime. So I think the key findings there is that they might actually just um, move where the marginal refinancing operation rate is and move that down to the deposit facility rate or very close to that. So that operational review piece is coming to light a bit more now, and it seems that sources are very much um, in line with where we see things moving forward as well. So um, I think in terms of next week, it should be fairly uneventful. But I think what has been interesting in the European rate space is how much um, pricing for cuts over this year has been have, has been taken out. And I think a lot of that has been driven quite a lot by the US. We've obviously had US data that has shifted European rates pricing. And I mean, there's obviously this question of will the ECB cut if the Fed isn't cutting? And we've said this many times before, but I think what really matters here is that the Fed does cut uh, versus a, um, a couple of months of a lag or so. But I definitely think that where we are at these levels is perhaps uh, a bit overstretched. Um, you know, I think that if you take our central scenario, we've got 100 basis points in cuts priced into for, in price, price for this year or 100 basis points expected for this year. And the market has shifted below that um, so around 90 basis points at this level. Um, I do think that the if you consider the balance of risks, which I think would be a 25 basis point cut uh, starting from June, either every meeting or every other meeting, I think a, a, a reasonable space to stay in will be 100 basis points. We obviously have the view as well that if the ECB is a bit late to cut, that they could cut by 50 basis points at the first meeting. So I definitely think that in terms of the balance of risks, I completely agree with Daniel points um, in the euro area as well, where I think that the room for us to sell off um, even more is a bit capped at this, I think, 75 basis points for this year, whilst I think the room to rally really is uh, at this point. So I do also like being long the front end in Europe uh, as well at this point. Anyway, that's enough for me. And I think we've all uh, had a pretty exciting week and more excitement to come in the next week. Thank you for listening. And if you like this week's episodes, don't forget to like it wherever you stream it or wherever you listen to this podcast. Uh, thanks again. See ya.